completely scripted music. Uh, when you're dealing with orchestras, you of course write everything completely out because it's it's necessary. It's so funny. A lot of young people tell me, "Well, I have a master's degree in music." Well, that's a wonderful thing. It's not going to do you much good in church, but it's really great you got it. It's very helpful to know a lot about music, uh, but a lot of things that they teach you in in in, in uh, college to obtain a master's is a great deal of choral technique and a, and a lot of voicings and you study a lot of ancient music and you study a lot of you know time periods in music and, and that's all good information to have and Miss Judy could probably share more of that right now she's fresh out of that than I could but when it comes down to what most people are doing in churches today um, it's, it's really you're, you're getting more and more hard pressed to find churches that do choirs anymore and I think that's sad. We still do choir here, and we will probably continue to do choir. But when you're dealing with a small church, uh, how many how many churches that you work in here are 500 and below? See what I mean? So your resources are not going to be. It, it's kind of unfair. That's the reason we've kind of changed our focus. When we first were going to do a worship conference in the beginning of the revival, we were going to do something where we did the full choir and brought in an orchestra and all that kind of business. And that's wonderful. And we could hire an orchestra here, which is usually what most large churches do because most of your people who play volunteer, it's, it's one thing to be a plumber and be a drummer or a bass player. You're not going to play as well as the guy who plays every day of his life. But with wind instruments, with horns, your lip goes out of shape unless you're playing every day. So you can't really be an accomplished horn player unless you're doing it for a living or you're serious enough about your instrument to pick it up and keep your lip in condition because if your lip loses its condition, then you can't hold a tone. And then your orchestra sounds somewhat like the Hooterville band. And it's embarrassing. And horns are not quiet instruments, so it's not like you can hide them somewhere. I know this. You can't hide them somewhere. They're just kind of out there. So most large churches wind up hiring players or putting them on staff. That's something that never has really been a priority to us at this point because God has led us into kind of a real free worship situation. And it doesn't fit for everyone. But for us, it works. And it's feel, it feels like for this time period, this is where God has us. But we use numbers a great deal. Matt Pearson had played bass for me on Friday night, on Sunday night, and he'll play bass again tonight. Now, Chris has been playing with Mike because Chris plays with Mike all the time. He's the young guy who's just starting. Matt, uh, the guy in the black over there picking up the bass, is a studio musician in Nashville, a good friend that I've gotten to know, and he played on the record I just completed. We just finished. Uh, a new integrity record called Open Up the Sky, and it releases, they tell me August, I think. August 28th is what I heard. It was a street date, and if you're in the club, I think it's sometime in Feb uh, it's February, right? Uh, sometime in July. So, And Matt played on that recording, and he's a really great player. I had never used Matt on a recording before then. Um, I'm, I'm very excited that he's here today. Of course, he's had a couple of days of figuring out why am I here, I'm sure, because these guys are doing such a good job. But uh, you're here for me, just for insurance. I appreciate it so much, making me feel good. But tonight, he'll, he'll get a workout. Uh, but what we do is, is a lot of times with Matt walking in here, playing Sunday morning, we, we've got charts for most everything. Uh, could somebody give me a chart book, a choir chart book, or just a rhythm chart book so I can kind of show the folks what we use? And I'll give you an idea. We have proper rhythm charts for our, for our band, but there are times when proper rhythm charts just aren't any good. Like when the glory comes, or when you're writing prophetically, when you're making it up as you go. And what I tend to do, thanks, brother. What I tend to do when I'm writing something up or, or doing a prophetic thing is use numbers. 
this is six because you can't do six on one hand. I'll just put a finger down for six. The reason is, is because those are the basic chords that you're going to use in a song. You're going to use a one chord, a four chord, a five chord, a six chord, a two chord, sometimes a three. Now, if obviously I can't sign augments, augments and all that kind of stuff, you hope that your musicians have an ear. It's a good idea. Uh, but it's as simple as this. For those who, how many have never heard of this before, so I want to know how, how elementary I have to be. Okay, I'm going to start at the bottom and go up. I won't take but a few minutes, so I'm just going to plant a seed. You won't get it right now. But driving down the road one day listening to an album, you'll catch it. You'll have a CD on, you'll go, oh, that's a four. You will. You'll develop your ear. It's really, really simple. If you got a C scale is the simplest that everybody knows, and we know it has seven tones, C, D, E, F, G, A, B. And, of course, C again, which, okay? We all know that. Elementary, right? This, be, instead of thinking of these as notes, as the, Judy, uh, Judy, would you help me at the piano? Yeah, see, I'll play it up here. This one over here. Just get up there and get your wings on that. And I play me at just a C scale. Okay, that's a C scale. But I don't want you to think of it as single tones. I want you to think of it as chords. Okay? So, this is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, one. Okay? It's that simple. Uh, play me an E flat scale. Guess what? E flat. My brain ain't working. F, G, A flat, B flat, C, C, thank you, D. I'm off. One, two, three, four, five. B flat, C, D, E flat. Same thing. Okay? Na 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 Think of them as chords. So if I wanted to do something like um, what's something we've sung that's real easy this week? Uh, all right, how about this? Everybody know we will ride. Okay, I thought you might. We do it in C, usually, unless I'm Sometimes we do it in D if, I feel real, if I'm feeling real spry. <laughs> We've done it in B before. Usually it's in C. So we go, you got our, it's 4-4, right? The time signature is 4-4. means every measure gets 4. It's basic theory. So slow 4, 1, 2, 3, 4. Okay, right? Here it is. He has fire in his eye and a sword in his hand. And he's riding a white horse. Oh, he's riding in his land. He has fire in his eye. That's an F. And a sword in his hand. Riding a white horse. Yes, he is all across his land. And he's calling out to you and me. Yes, he is. Will you ride with me? Now, if I wanted to get real fancy, I would split this bar in two and make it a, an equal count and put a five right here. And I would put a little seven over it, and guess what that means? One, that means I'm going to play a split bar of G and G7. So it would be G2, G7. Okay? That's all it is. It's that simple. Now, what's lovely about that is I can play that in A. I can play, as long as I know my basic scale. All you got to know is the scale in every chord, in, in every key. And know the chord that corresponds to it. Do you understand? It's that simple. Well, what if I need to play a minor? Uh, the relative minor to C is A, a minor. So if play C, A minor. And you walk down. You did, a, you did a little walk down. But what if I don't want you to do a walk down? I just want you to go straight to A minor. Now play, uh, play F. Play D minor. See, those, again, relative minors are the six minor and the two minor in any key. If you're in B flat, it's C minor and G minor. So it's as simple as that. If I were going to write 
uh, amazing grace. It's three, four. In other words, he gets three counts per measure, right? Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I was once lost, but now I'm found. It's a country version. Was blind, but now I see. Now, I didn't write the six, but she played it. Now, if I want to create a little more interest in this song, this is a guitar chart right here. This is for people who don't read music, guitar players. And I'm kidding. It's a joke. It's this, but can y'all see over there okay? I'm sorry. I'm just hogging the thing here. If I want to create more interest in this little guy, I can play. Play me something. Now, don't get real crazy because my ear is not that sharp anymore, but play something. Play Amazing Grace to me in the key of G and play it adding a, a couple of minors here and there. So, I'll, all right, now watch what I'm doing. Do it slow, go slowly. I'm old. Two. Ah, oh, there's a seven. All right. That's nice, I got that. Uh oh, one, two, three. Uh oh, what do I do there? She walked down from a C, so what she did, she played a D in her right hand and she played an F sharp, I mean a G sharp, with her left. She walked down to the E minor, okay? So she's winding up here, so this becomes, instead of a one, we make it a six minor, right? But how do we make that, how do we make it, how do I tell the musicians that on the chart that I want to go that little walk down? What was the count? One, two, and on three. I went down, right? Now there's several ways to do it, but the quick cheaty way is to go like this. Okay, what's a D in the G scale? G, A, B, C, D. It's a five. So all I do is one, two, three. I write a five over A. What's, an, what's, a, what's a G sharp in the scale? It's a seven. So I write a five over seven. Now, how do I tell my musicians that I want them to only play it on one beat? Well, I can use notation. I could use a half note and a quarter note, or I can do this. So that tells them that one, two, three, one, two, three. Now, what do you play after that six minor? Can we fancy that up a little bit? The wretch. What are you playing there? An A9? She's playing an A9. How would I write an A9 in a number chart? Well, what's A? In G, it's, an a, it's, it's, it's two. So I do A, two, nine. Oh, she's, I know what she's going to do. You're going to do a, you're going to do that thing. I know it's coming. Yeah. So what that was, was a two minor seven. And then, if you're real fancy, you'll play a four over five, five, and that goes one, two. That's what she just played. Oh, now she changes keys. Off the five, she went to a new key. You rat. You see, and again, this is probably going over your head a little bit, some of you. You're going, oh, I can't read that. But the beauty of this, with your worship band, if you'll get, I mean, think, the bass player, all he's got to do is read the bottom line. One, one, four, one, seven, six, two, two, five, five. The bass player just going to read. Do you see what I'm saying? But what it's going to cause the guitar player and the piano player to do is he's got to know basic chords. He's got to understand basic inversions. He's got to have the basic theory down so you understand that there are three ways to play G. There's a first inversion G, second inversion G, third inversion G, okay? There's, there's three or four ways to play it. What this doesn't do that music will do is it will tell you which inversion to play. Lines and spaces will tell you which one. But see, in worship music, you're depending a lot on your ear. And so you have to develop your ear to learn how to, uh, to hear an inversion 
And, and, here, and what's so neat about it is uh, you can go down. I've actually gone down this, the road listening to the radio and heard a chorus on the way to church and think, I think we'll sing that. And I'll just grab a pen at the stoplight and write out a chord chart. I just write out a number chart. It takes two seconds. Jesse gave me uh, who can compare to you. Is that chart up here? Where would it go? M no, mine. Mine. The, the one I had. Hmm. The church rats got it. It's the one I scribbled on. We're prepared, you can tell. Oh. You ever notice when you're looking for something or the CD's waiting to start or the track isn't cued, it seems like it takes a million years? It's got, it'll be the last one, so won't we start at the back? Uh, ain't that right? Okay. Uh, Jesse walked in here the other day with this song, Who Can Compare to You, the woman singing, Who can compare to you, my Lord? I jotted a little number chart. And that way, it's in D, but if she chooses not to do it in D, I can go to another key. So I don't have to, I don't have to sit here at the piano. She does it in D. Well, what if I want to do it after she's gone? If I choose to do the song after she's gone because I've got a number chart, it's D. Okay? I think I want to do it, but I can't sing in that key. Let's see, I may want an F. Who can come back to you? I want an F. Well, I can play it. One. Who can come back? Oops, I'm in the right chord. One. Who can come five minutes to you, my six minor? You're every five over one. Uh, you're, uh, you're every five. I, I, wait, I'm in F now. You're every five that I want through over three, four. All of my five sus. There you go. Let me let me call out the numbers. I'll look at them. Okay, two, three, and one. None of my five. You're my six minor. Split bar five, one, three, fast. Four, one over three. One, two over seven, flat. Five, sus, five. One, five, six, minor. Five, one over three, fast. Five sus to five to one. So I'm not having to look at the chart and go, now that's G minor in that chord. Now how would I do that three steps up? I just went up from the key of D to the key of F for me. So I didn't have to relearn it. Do you understand the principle? It's that simple. And I've thrown a lot at you. Uh oh, I'll see you again. I've thrown a lot at you at a quick time, and I don't expect you to grasp it all. But go home and play with it. Just get, just get your basic theory out and play with it and understand if you're leading music in a church, it's a valuable tool. Because that fast, like, well, I'll show you how fast. I'll show you how fast. We got a drummer back there? Hey, there he is. We're going to pretend and make up a song. We're going to pretend I'm in the spirit. Let's see. Let me get something I want to do. I love being vulnerable. Let's do four four, kind of a do to do it. That'll do it right there. Let's just make this up. You're really cool. Like what you do, I love you, Jesus. Worthy is the Lamb. You're really cool. I like what. 
saying my players aren't these guys have been playing two three years but except for Matt he don't count he's been playing six months <laughs> so is there any questions about that any qu yes Right, it becomes a seven flat. Yeah, which is what we did on Who Can Compare to You. Be because I was playing, a, a, it becomes a seven flat. He, he was talking about what do you do with, with chords, with notes that are not in the, that are not in the scale. In other words, uh, what if you want to play something. Now, calling those by hand is a little difficult. Because how do you do a flat? I mean, you can work anything out with your band. They'll, they'll learn how to go with you. Our band goes with me wherever I go. But like, uh, if you're in G, let's go to C because that's more familiar with everybody. We're in C and I want to play an E flat. It's not in the, it's not in the, uh, uh, let's play a, let's play a one, three flat, four, six flat, Seven flat one. Ready? One, two, three, and a one. Three flat, four, six flats. That's a seven. A seven flat. That's a seven flat. So it's all all those are off the off the chart. The chart because so it's you can just it's simple as flatten it or sharpening it. You know, and all of your rules still apply to like ninths. And, and like 13ths are still, I mean, you still call those what they are, but you just call them a number instead of a chord. So the keyboard player and guitar player still have to understand basic theory. Matt could probably, well, yeah, that's true. He just has to read the bottom line. <laughs> the bottom line is about, so that's how you do that. Because uh, didn't, what's that cool that progression y'all had and how beautiful? What is it? What, chord, what key is the song in? F. And what's the chord? G flat major seven. G seven. B flat. Did y'all hear that this morning in the song at the end of the second verse? Okay. Well, he he's in F. So none of that is in the in the in the <laughs> in the the scale of F. So you, it's it's like. So you'd write it on a chord chart as a one, a six flat, major seven, a two, which is a G, and then a B flat, and then a four. That's all it is. Okay? Believe me, if I can play it, it ain't rocket science. Did I leave the microphone down there? Okay, Bill, you can have it, brother. If it was you, anybody, nobody else I'd let do that, but you can take my mic anytime you want to. Does that answer their question, brother? Okay, good. Yes. There, Matt, are you familiar with a book that's available on, on numbers? Chaz Williamson. The book's called The Nashville Number System, Chaz Williamson. And I'm, it's probably not going to change your life, but, but for me, it's what I learned on. Matter of fact, I can read this better, Chad Williamson. Can I, can I, lay, oh, can I tell you all a real secret? Now, I was really a proper, I, what do you say proper? I'm a shoe, gun, a shoe gum detective. See, I'm really not talented. I don't even read music really, really well. I self-taught myself, okay? Like you didn't know that. But I was arranging for this, like, choir that kind of had a national, you know, they kind of had a national platform, and all of a sudden, here I am arranging, and I can barely read. So I made this work for me, 
Because I figured you can get people who can read and write music. They're a dime a dozen. But most of them don't arrange. They just play other people's stuff. Okay? I hear all the arrangements in my head, but I didn't know how to get them down. It's perfect if you have a great ear and you learn to read, too. That's the perfect marriage. I had to really work hard to, to learn what, what theory I have and read them because it was very hard for me. I, again, I grew up in a little bitty church in the country, and our choir was everybody comes sing lead. You know what I mean? Y'all come. Now, come on now. Sister Mabel, why aren't you up here? Come on up here. I just don't feel like, oh, how many would like to hear Sister Mabel sing the choir? Come on, Sister Mabel. Get. Does that bear witness with anybody? Okay, you know how I learned about theory? Matt, Matt, you'll laugh at this. This is the truth. I was probably, I wasn't as far along in music as you are right now, Mike. And somebody had taught me the number system. And one day, I, I had just learned the number system because I didn't understand how, how chords worked, except that I played them all the time. But I, didn't really, I knew what key I was in, I knew what chord it was, but I didn't understand playing different inversions. I didn't understand. I, I learned to play in A. It was the first chord I ever learned to play in. So I hated B flat. So I was really weird for piano players because I'd rather play, even today, I'd rather play in A than B flat. I hate B flat. But I love A because that's where I learned. And, and also another one I learned to play in was, uh, was D flat because there's a lot of black keys in it. You could do a lot of gospel stuff in it because it's all kind of there in one place. Um, so one day I was listening to a record and I was thinking, you know, our choir should be singing parts, but I don't even know what to call them. This is how stupid. I mean, really, not stupid. Uh, juvenile. There you go, juvenile. So one day I was thinking, well, you know, we're singing a melody line. I wonder what would happen. I got to thinking when I'm playing a chord, there's a melody that follows. You know, there's a, there's a, there's a, it kind of works, you know. Because back then we played like, what a fellowship, right? Can I play it now? I don't know. Okay. So I thought, you know, and, and I'm playing this chord. Well, somebody should be singing. That's how I learned. And then I thought, well, and, and I didn't know what to call it. So I went to the choir practice, Matt, and I said, now anybody who can sing this note, sing it. And if that one's too high, you sing this one. <laughs> That's how I found my parts with the choir. That's how I learned. And, and even when I went to Christ Church to be, the direct, to be the arranger, I told them when I went, I said, I'm not real fast at reading. I said, I can arrange all day but I can't read really fast. And part of the deal was with Lanny Gardner, he said, if you'll learn how to read, uh, you know, and, and work at it, it's fine with me. As long as you can get it in a readable, as long as you can teach the parts. I said, oh, I can do that. So you know what I would do? You know what I'd do? I'd write the lyric here, okay? All right, oh, let me do it better than that. Uh, who, since we're on who can compare, I would write the lyric out, and then I would write, na, 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 na. I'd write the melody up here, and da, da, who can compare with, so I knew that got two beats, so I'd go, da, 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 that would be numbers, and then I would do a little sign like this, and then I'd write a three or a five or whatever one here, and then I would go down here and I would do the same thing. And then I would do a little thing right here. And then I would go right here and do this. And I had my soprano, my alto, my tenor, and my bass lines. And I would sit there and play my little numbers because I could read numbers really fast. And then I would get with Steve Malden, who's a great arranger, and I'd say, Steve, and I'd go sit down and put it on script paper, and I would never get any of my rhythms right. They were always messed up. I'd get the right notes in the right places, but when you're writing gospel choir stuff, it's got a lot of rhythm and syncopation, and that's hard stuff to write. And I was doing it all by hand. So I, I'd never get the syncopations right, and Steve would look over, and he's like my, he, was like, he was like the principal going, well, uh, you missed that one, and you missed that one, and you missed... But that's how I... Learned how to, how to write the choir parts. So I'm telling you, wherever you are, at whatever level your church is at, there's always room to improve, but you can always use what you have right now. 
If you don't, you have people who can't read, fine. Just teach them what key they're in and go from there. If you're trying, another thing let me recommend to you, if you're trying to use a bunch of piano music and you don't have a great pianist, then go to guitar music if you've got a good guitar player. I found that the Lord sends to a church what they need. The Lord never intended for us to sit around going, well, we could really, well, it's unfair to walk into a place like Brooklyn Tabernacle or some church that's got a choir and an orchestra and everything's just flying all over the place and it's so awesome. And then you go home to your 50 people and go, now how do we pull that off? Well, what you're going to do is you're going to wind up singing the soundtracks with their choir on the left hand and the band on the right side, you're going to put a little choir in. That's what you're going to do if you want to try to recreate that. But, you know, Larry Goss arranges, he's a ranger in Nashville, and he arranges most of that Brooklyn Tabernacle stuff, and it's full of flat 13ths and flat 9s, and it's schmaltzy, and, 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 you know, I have to work hard to play it, because that's not my thing. I grew up on ISPCT, find out what it means to me, respect just a little bit. That's what I grew up on. You know, I didn't listen to Frank Sinatra and all that schmaltz stuff. I just didn't like it when I was a kid. I liked R&B and I wanted all that screaming and yelling and swaying and you know I, that's what I liked. I liked all the 70s R&B music and and Billy Preston. Will it go around in circles? That's what I grew up with. You know so I, I had no relevance to that schmaltzy church stuff that people wanted to do. So I had to work hard to try to play those chords and still I'm not good at it. Rhythm is my thing. I'm better at rhythm than I am the other things. But if you're trying to put Saul's armor on your little Davids, they're always going to be clunky. Get them built up to where they can be the king, but let them start as little Davids. If all your players can play is G, C, and D, and it sounds like a guitar band, well, man, just have a guitar band. Ever heard of a garage rock and roll band in high school? Do it. Whatever God has given you, whatever's in your hand, just use it. I can't play like so-and-so. Well, fine, you shouldn't. You should be wherever you are doing what the Lord has put in your hand and then just progress with it. Who are you trying to impress anyway? Now, the Lord calls us to excellence to do the best we can. But, but I got more people out there who are trying to do the best they can, and they're frustrated uh, musicians, frustration. It's like the same word, isn't it? Musician, frustrated. Always just frustrated because they can't, can't play a flat 13th. Can't, my, I just don't have this. I just don't have that. I've even known people who were so intimidated by other people that was unattainable. That's one of the things. See, Satan does anything to shut you up, to silence your instrument, to stop you from singing, to stop you from worshiping. He'll do anything. And intimidation is his best one because he'll put you directly in reference to someone who's better than you and you'll just crawl back in a hole and go, I can't do this. I can't do this. And you go put it in the, you go put your music in the closet and you'll never pull it out again. And a lot of people don't even do it anymore. They, they've, they've quit playing altogether because, you know, they're perfectionists and it goes right along with being a musician. That melancholy temperament has that perfectionist in it. And you know what a perfectionist is? Here's my joke. A perfectionist is one who takes great pains and gives them to others. A real true perfectionist is never happy with anything he does. Justin is a perfectionist. Justin, back here on the drums, we tracked this whole record before you got here just in case the glory came, which we hoped it would, and we didn't get a chance to get anything on tape, we thought, well, we'll get a safety on tape. I came in and Justin said, boy, the first four, four, four songs we recorded were just horrible. Well, I learned a long time ago producing records that you never let a musician edit himself because he always has a better one. But the trouble is, is what he thinks is a better one may not be what you as a producer are looking for as a better one. And then you get into that red light monster where you keep hitting the red light and it gets worse. And you go, man, if I, you remember that you produced a few records where you go, boy, if I had that first take I had back, I'd give anything just to have it. Because we get to, and in, see, intimidation is something that Matt had to deal with to do what he does for a living. But it also comes down from studio level to church level, especially in church, because you feel like, well, you know, well, 
Jimmy over here is a pastor's wife, and she's starting to play the piano. I don't know what happened to your piano player. She at college or moved away, and you and you don't feel like you're anything. She told me yesterday, well, I'm just a little old church piano player. What's a little old church piano player? I thought they were just piano players. Do you see what I'm saying? It's that thing of being intimidated because, you know, someone plays better. Get a clue. Someone will always play better. Someone will always be better than you. Someone will always have better chops, better licks, better songs. So where does this thing stop? This is where the world has got to come out of the church, and we've got to get a kingdom mentality. Yes, we want to do excellence, but let me tell you something that's wrong right now in, in, in American church music. We've all heard so many great praise and worship records, and, and Integrity has done an awesome job with that. When the Ron Cannoli records came out in the, late, in the middle 80s, they were smoking records, but who was playing on them for heaven's sake? Abe Laboriel. Y'all got any Abe Laboriels in your church playing bass? No. You got Bubba that's a plumber during the day playing bass. <laughs> and Bubba can't play like Abe. Now, was that wrong for integrity to do that? No, I use studio musicians on records because here's the thing. With a recording, it's eternal. And no matter how much you love Brownsville Revival, I got people all the time going, at eh, buy them one and two, they've got the glory on them. That rest that stuff that you got fixed, it ain't got the glory. But see, that's people who know us and know us intimately. People going down the street, too much out of tune and unprepared music, you don't just love to put in your car. Tell me, do you put your rehearsal tape in your car and take it home and play it for home enjoyment? No, you don't. You don't do that because you, suddenly those, those flat notes that the soprano was singing and those missed notes the bass player hadn't got and the guitar player who wasn't, whose fifth string wasn't quite in tune and, and, and that, you know, that, 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 that run that the piano player moved when we were stepping up and we were all going to a G7 over B and, and he, played, uh, he played something like in the key of Z in it. But your church, see, I've heard some really stinky local church records. I mean, bad. But the people who hand them to me love them because they go, oh, well, you've got to hear our church. You've had this too happen too. They love it because they know the people. They go, oh, these people, oh, that sister, that sister Hooten knew. She's playing the organ. You know, she lost her husband to cancer a few years ago. She is so sweet. We love her. You know, bless her heart. Yeah, that voice that's like just about three millitones below the pitch in the, in the alto section in the choir. Bless her heart. That's Sister Hazel. You know, Hazel, Hazel's been one of the most faithful choir members we've ever had in our church. She's always here. Well, you know, you know and that guitar player, and the, the trombone guy, you know, he, I know he misses a couple of those licks, but you know, he's been... Do you know that he had arthritis and couldn't even play and the Lord healed him? Well, see, that blesses a local church. But when you throw it out there in the mass public and the church going public, you put it in and go, what in the world are they thinking? Right? So let's understand, local church recordings have a place and a purpose. But when we started recording things at Brownsville and it looked like it had a bigger purpose, we knew that we had to brush and polish a little bit because there was a great possibility that it would have a larger audience than what we had anticipated it would. The reason volume one, volume two, and I like those records, I've, I've slammed them pretty hard, but the Lord touched them and His glory is on them, I thank Him for it. Uh, but it wouldn't have happened without those. But I've had my own church people come up to me and say, Linda, why don't you, why did you get, start getting all these guys in and fixing all these records? Not for Brownsville, because they were happy with that, but for the people who haven't ever heard of us, and one day a CD gets in their hand, I want it to be tolerable musically, but I also want the glory of the Lord to be on it. You understand? If your pastor is going to send out one of his sermons to be aired on CNN, it will be his best one. Do you understand? Okay. Back to where I was. 
But where you are, work with what you got. Don't put Saul's mantle on a little David. Work with what you got. Improve it. There's lots of resources out there. Uh, I think that's all I want to say about that. Uh, I want to go into kind of a... Yes. Here it comes. Easily. Easily. Absolutely. Guitar and piano, same thing. I mean, this is universal. The scale, the music scale is universal. Works on violin, works on everything. Sort of, but they have to play in a different key. We won't even go there. <laughs> when you get into some woodwinds and, and stringed instruments, it's different. But for a basic band, which is a lot of what we're doing in the church today, guitars, drums, bass, all that sort of thing. All right, now here's what I want to do. I want to, I'm oh, sorry. If you're a guitar player and you're leading worship, how can you uh, communicate uh, the chord sequences to the rest of the band? You know, like you do the one. I knew you were going to ask something like that. <laughs> Unless you've got an extra hand, you can't. I'm just saying, for my prep, for my purpose as a piano player, it works for me. Uh, one of the things you can do that would be valuable to you is, like Matt. Uh, you'll probably see him do this tonight. Uh, I'll take off on something he doesn't have a chart for. And he'll lay out the first time around. And what he's doing is he's got a pencil in hand over there and he's... Second time around, he's in. That's where it would be helpful to a guitar player. Do you all have an idea how to tell a guitar? How to... Yeah, when you're trying to sing, I mean, there's no other... other the Lord is one, hallelujah. Oh, bless the four, oh, my five. I mean, there's not a whole lot. Jesse. <laughs> the intercessors could have cue cards because they're in tune. They know what we're going to do before we do it, isn't it? It's true. Yes, sir. What, soundtracks? S Winds of Worship? All right, Winds of Worship was not our recording. It was a vineyard recording. So we have no authority or power to make a sound. We don't even have the masters on that. They, they own, Vineyard owns the masters, so we couldn't make any soundtracks for it. Another thing is we didn't make CD tracks for a long time because of the cost. Uh, but that's all come down, and now we're starting to do that on some of the older projects. Because I've, I've been amazed at some of the smaller churches that use the tracks as worship tools. And uh, CD works a whole lot better than a cassette. <laughs> Have you got it cute? Here I am, my brother! Oh, I mean, it's... <laughs> yes, sir. You don't like acoustic... I mean, I, I pick up on your music. You don't really like a lot of acoustic stuff. I mean, enriched guitar. Do you not like... I do. I love it. It's just, again, I use what God has given me here. And Ben has been here a while, but he hasn't been playing a long, long time here at the church. And I'm just learning his strengths and weaknesses because I lead from a piano. And so we're a vineyard church or a worship leader who uses acoustic guitar. He'll lead with a more strong acoustic sound. I try to use what's here. Uh, God sent me, with Charlie, sent me a really good, really good guitar player, good electric guitar player. I want to tell you another thing. If you have a church that's a little larger uh, and you can do this, it's something I did and it's paid off big. Uh, besides the fact that God was doing a phenomenal thing here and kids, these kids were in church four or five nights a week hearing music over and over and over, that's wonderful. That was very helpful. Like Matt being down here, uh, in the way of bass players, we've had Gary Lunn here, uh, Matt Pearson, uh, Craig Nelson. We've had a lot of the Nashville player guys, drummers. We've had uh, Scott Williamson, Steve Brewster. And I bring those guys in for two reasons. Number one, if we're recording and I want to get it a little, a little more accurate, 
because a lot of my young drummers weren't at a place where they could do this. But the other side of that is I told Steve Brewster the first year he came down in 96, I said, now, Steve, I'm bringing you in. Now, Steve, is a, 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 he's a studio, a studio drummer. He's played on every, you name it. Uh, Michael W. Smith, all those people. He's played on all their records. And I said, if you're coming down here, and I'm paying you to come down here. I said, but here's what I'm also asking you to do. I want you to let all my little guy drummers around here and girl drummers and whatever I've got bug you to death. I want them to be little, like little flies on the wall, and I want them to ask you questions about tuning the drums, playing the drums, pester you. You're being paid to be pestered. And it has paid off because the first year, you know, that's really... The, the drummer you're hearing now, you've heard through the conference, is, is really, he's been mentored by Steve. And they've developed a relationship and they're trading. I get the benefit of a young drummer who's been mentored personally by a great drummer. It cost me some money, it wasn't cheap, but it paid way off. Just bringing and letting these guys, when I was young, a young upstart drummer, a musician, I had no opportunity to be in touch with anybody who played really great, just church folks. But today, with worship conferences all over the nation and a lot of the great things that are happening, you need to get your young musicians and your kids exposed to some good brothers in the Lord who play really well and get them around them. Because the musicians are really low-key people. They're usually not, it's the artists that get all arrogant and cocky and weird. The musicians are just kind of everyday folks that make a living playing instrument. And they're really some very, very sweet people. All right, let me do a couple things. I've gone longer on that than I wanted to. Uh, let's, Mike, you want to help me? We're going to dissect a few grooves. Is that okay? Uh, just kind of break them down. Now, I'm doing this just primarily because there are four or five ways to play songs. You can play them if you only have a piano, if you only have acoustic guitar, if you only have, if you only have drummer, you're really in pretty serious shape unless you have a lot of Indian descent, you know, and, and you can just kind of hit the drums and go. And I kind of liked that the other day with y'all with that little drum. And, and out, at our, out at our Bible school, we have uh, a whole bunch of drummers that play sometimes, it's just drums. That's kind of fun. Uh, let's see, something we've played this week that we'd be familiar with. That board, huh? Uh, give me an idea. Let's see, let's come up with something. Um, open up the sky. You know, open up the sky? It's kind of a rock feel, kind of a driving, not kind of, it's a rock and roll driving feel. So let's, let's hear it, how I how it is normally, just, just the intro kind of. We're just gonna take the groove apart. And we're gonna talk about the difference in the way it feels throughout the song, because a lot of times what church musicians do wrong, believe me, I've played with them all my life, is they don't know how to use dynamic, and they just play wide open all the way through the song. And it never goes anywhere, it just kind of stays right here. But there is a way every instrument can change its dynamic feel and, and the way it's played that will give it more emphasis or less emphasis. I used to have a guitar player in my church that thought he had to play every song loud. Y'all ready? during the intro. Okay, what did you start playing on the verse? 
He started playing more staccato things, more feel and rhythm. Because here's another thing musicians don't understand. Here's the thing. Let me give my good church example. When you learn to play church piano, the problem with you most of the time is that you learn how to, you all went to, you got those, what's those John A. something books you learned from? And they taught you at your, it's, it's like. So you did this bass chord chord was your rhythm, right? And then you had your, and so you got the church lady who goes. And I mean, she's like wearing you out. Y'all are laughing because you know someone like that. The best thing you can do for her is cut her right arm off. Yes. Cut her right arm off and, and, and t t cut this finger off so she can't play any six chords. That's these. And this one. All right, get rid of that stuff. Because here's what Open Up the Sky looks sounds like. Y'all play normal, and I'm going to play Sister Hootendoodle. You ready? in church and she usually is married to the pastor and you can't tell her what you really think about her because you'll get fired or she's the wife of the head deacon do you see how just doing that just ruined the whole thing and sister Hoodoodle just needs to understand that all we need from her on this song, because it's a driving rock feel, the drums, the bass, and the guitar are carrying this. You're just kind of here. I'm playing three notes. And just on my left hand, that's all I'm doing. This hand's doing. I'm not even changing positions. That's the whole course. You don't believe it? Watch when you add the bass. See, the, the moving bass note makes the whole chord sound different, but all I'm doing is. And that's the hardest thing to get Sister Hootendoodle to do because she wants to play those chords. She went to school for years and went through all 12 of those books and she learned how to, and, and what's even worse is when she rolls the third. But it's not needed. Okay, enough foolishness. I've got this thing sounding all bad. There it is, okay. Now, let me get back to where I was. It, it, really, she can learn to do less than if she can't fire. Uh, no, I'm kidding. It's just the thing about doing less. When you're playing in a band, less is more. Now, show me Justin back there on the, on the drums. Play, play a couple of bars of the intro feel for that song and then play a little bit of the verse for me. Intro. Verse. Notice what he changed is how he's playing his hi-hat. What else did you change? I went from the, the driving kick thing to just the kick on the one. Change, play us the two different kick patterns so we can hear the difference. That's the intro kick drum. One, two, three, one. So he just went to ones on the kick. That's a change. And that subtlety, he doesn't really stop how loud he's playing so much. He does, but it doesn't just go down in volume. What happened is, what you heard happen was everybody played less because we wanted to give emphasis to the words of the verse. It was that simple. Um, guitar, Charlie, you were doing that da 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 da. You were doing the melody on the intro, right? What are you doing on the verse? <laughs> more rhythmic be 
because if he was still playing that, that figure he was playing on the intro, it would just never have any change or feel to it. Okay. Uh, ben. If you only have a guitar player, can you still do this song? Sure. It sounds like this. Still good. on the verses. See, he's just hitting the one again, emphasizing the one and letting it hold because the song needs to lay back. You see what I'm saying? Everybody's playing less. Yes. How much emphasis do you allow your musicians to have? How much emphasis? Yeah, how much of their expression do you allow them to have? We actually, this is a joke. We put them all in a box and we let them out when we want them. No, I'm kidding. Uh, could could y'all answer that better than me? I, you mean input, or oh, emphasis on how, uh, input of how they want to play the song, how they want to interpret it. Uh, Mike, that's a good one for you. Come here, you're going the wrong way. You got a mic. Charlie wants to say something. Say something. Preach, boy. Stand up so they can see who you are. People's throwing it. That's Charlie. Basically, uh, what I try to do, and there's a lot of guitar players who like to solo over the verse and, and the chorus and everything, and that's, that's what I try not to do. The best thing that a guitar player could do is try to mix in with the sound and help the overall sound not stand out. And then when, when a time comes to where there's like maybe a free worship time or there's a time to where you feel that you could add something to the song by playing a creative part, then that's when I would do something towards being more creative or expressing more good of a lead line or something, if that answers any of your questions. Well, like for instance, Mike, you and Jesse, uh, you all came in here Wednesday to rehearse for this record. How much input do you, add, do you give, for instance, Justin, if he, he hears something different, how much input do they all? Uh, well, pretty much all the songs when we did them, a lot of the songs, the songs that I've written that we did, we changed them up to how I heard it because I, I heard it a little bit more this way or that way. But I, I would ask Justin automatically, like, well, what do you feel on the, on the drum pattern there? And most of his ideas were always better than mine. So I would always just go, guys, pretty much any time I do a new song, even if it's not one that we've written, if it's just something that we do for worship, I'll just say, guys, what do you got? We'll go back and listen to the tape. And we'll listen to some of the stuff that they're doing, they're, you know, how hard they're playing when they're coming in real soft and stuff. And then we learn it. When we come out here, we pretty much just try our best to get that kind of a feel. So that's pretty much what we do. What I do to answer your question is I try to, I have an idea of what I want the, the song to be. But the minute that I step on stage with these players, see, I trust them and I know them and I know what they can do. And they may have a better idea. Matt just did a recording with me, and you know in rehearsals, I wasn't like a lot of artists or, or producers. A lot of producers know exactly what they want. I wrote the song, so it was hard for me to, to have a lot of say in them. I, I would think, well, I hear it, but I may not. I worry about a musician sometimes that always wants it his way. But at the same time, I open up the floor and say, hey, what do y'all, does this sound good to y'all? Do y'all hear something? Sometimes the guitar player will go, you know, I hear a thing right here. And why don't we put a solo here? And why don't we solo over these chords instead of the chord, the chorus chords? Or why don't we solo? I'm always open to hear that. And we'll try it. But because I'm the director, I have the ultimate final to go, well, we tried it, but I don't like it. You know, and then that's where all the musicians have to become a band. That's where you have to have a, a leader and a band. Even when we hire session players in a studio, there is a session leader and there is a producer. And that purpose of the producer is to say, here's a vision I've got. You guys go out and paint the picture. Here's the colors you can use. Y'all figure out what you can do. But the session leader will kind of tra kind of is supposed to <laughs> work with the producer and say, hey, what about this? Let's try this to help him in get his vision better but ultimately that producer will go no I think I like what we had a while ago better and 
that's where studio musicians have a wonderful attitude that church musicians must adapt. And that's what's, I've, I've, I've reaped that harvest with these guys up here. Because Justin will come up with something. If I don't like it, I'll just go, yeah, I just don't like it. And let's go back. And Justin knows as a professional, if you're going to be a professional at this, you, you just play what's asked, what you're asked to play, and you play it with all your heart. You don't half, half-heartedly play it because it isn't how you wanted it played. Because one of the things you're going to do in worship music and in church, you're going to play a lot of stuff you don't like. I said you're going to play a lot of stuff you don't like. Your pastor's favorite song a lot of times will not be yours. And you have got to get up there and give it all your heart. And, and somebody said, well, I can't do that. If you, get, if you get a better, a more professional attitude about yourself to go, you know what? This is a servanthood place. This is a place I serve. I serve as the director of music. Has John Kilpatrick and Steve Hill and everybody else I've ever worked for interrupted me in the middle of a flow? Yeah. Has poor Mike, I mean, come, the guy coming up, they, they give me more room than they do him, especially in the beginning. Because, you know, they're unsteady. Pastor Kilpatrick, I hope you don't ever hear this, but Jason is Justin's brother, the drummer. This is his brother on monitors. Well, Sunday morning, Pastor got up to preach. Now, Pastor has got, oh, I hope this don't get to him. He's got this thing about monitor guys, and there's about two of them in here that he feels comfortable if they're behind that desk. If they're not behind that desk, he's not comfortable. So he looked over and he saw Jason. He wasn't comfortable. He said, I can't hear anything. Well, he probably couldn't, so we turned him up. And finally, he just kept going, I just ain't right. Lyndall, would you go over there and help? Right. I don't even know which knob is what. But it made him feel better for me to walk over there and, and look like I knew what I was doing. And I said, I said, Jason, did you do anything different? He said, well, I turned him up. He said, but other than that, it's like it always is. And I said, well, let me just stand here in a minute and he'll feel better. <laughs> now, was that, that wasn't underhanded because sometimes I'm that way. When the first time Jesse Rogers came to this church, I, I heard this little girl's songs and and they were really good songs, but it was so amazing to me. I just kind of revisited with her a, a few months ago because I heard a, a, a tape that she had made at her church that included some of these songs. And it was so much more mature, and the songs were so much further there that I mean, it, I, it wasn't like when you did, she also did another song on one of her records called Come To Me, back on the live of Pensacola. She led, the night she led worship with Come To Me, I was nervous as a cat on a hot tin roof. Because here we were with the revival, and this young girl, I'd never, I didn't know her that well, and I handed her a microphone. And I thought, oh, Jesse, just sing the song and move on. You know what I mean? Because I wasn't comfortable with her doing what she's done this week. I trust her now, and I'm totally comfortable because I know she's not going to do something crazy. But when you hand something over to someone, you have to trust them sometimes. And it's the same with pastor. He, there's certain people he's tried and true, he's been in the trenches, but he hasn't been in the trenches with Jason yet. He'll learn to trust him. But that's the way it is a lot of times as a musician, as, as the, the, the leader of the music. The people, you have to learn to trust your musicians, and they in turn have to learn to trust you. And ultimately, serve one another. And understand that when you play, you play before the Lord, unto the Lord, and you give it all you got. One of the things we say about Steve Brewster, and I'm learning that about, about Justin, is Steve plays every note like he absolutely means it. And I'm telling you, these guys, you think that being a studio musician is flashy life? You play on some absolutely garbage songs with some absolute producers who don't know what they're doing. And they hire you, and you get in there, and it's just yuck. But I've seen Steve over and over and over. It's music he hates. He gets in there and plays it and tries to make sure he delivers as good as if it were his favorite style of music. And see, there's something to learn there for we that play in church. That 
if we're playing a mighty fortress or if we're playing just over in the glory land or if we're playing the one day stuff or if we're playing Matt Redman or we're playing Michael Motley or we're playing whatever we're playing, even if it isn't our favorite, give it all we got. I mean, do the best because we're not doing this just so people go, ooh, we're doing this. See, a lot of people think they play for the worship leader. You don't. You play for the Lord and you give it all you got. Any questions? I saw it. I see that hand. Uh, going back to the guy that's running the sound booth, you set your uh, all your levels before you start uh, the, the worship time. Do they ever change it once you get going on it? All the time. And that's another thing. A misconception in a lot of churches is that sound gets set and stays. Because I go to churches, I was at a church in California. We were at a church in California, and, and, and the, 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 the guy said, look, we've got everything set, so just when you're done, put it back where it was. What you don't understand about sound is that everybody that walks, every single body that walks through the door changes the way it sounds because it absorbs sound. And it's the same with the monitors. We can think we've got it set, and theoretically, in a perfect world, we do set that before church. Sometimes we don't, but most of the time we should have a sound check. My theory in the way I work is I never yell at the sound people. I never throw books at them, and I never give them dirty looks. The only time that I'll get upset with them is if they're not watching me. You know? But the other thing is, is I'm not going to sit there and try to readjust all the sound unless something's gone out. I despise that. Here's what, my, what I used to tell Steve Hill when he'd fuss about the sound. I'd say, Steve, unless you want to come 30 minutes for a sound check, don't you say a word about how it sounds. And that's the theory. If you're not there for sound check and you don't like what you got, tough. You had an opportunity, and if you didn't get what you wanted, roll with it, baby. I'll just roll with it, baby. Thank you. Right? Because we got to do that, guys. We can't beat these sound people. These guys are musicians too. And, and the tough part of being a sound man is, what's that button you've got over there? They've got a fake button over there. What does it say, Jason? It's self-destruct. It's got a button over here, a little switch, switch with a light on it. It goes, self-destruct. <laughs> because literally sometimes when things go wrong, Everybody turns and looks back there. Like he's got an immediate answer. How many channels of, of, of that mixing console have back there, Days? There are 48 channels. There are several bands of EQ. There are all kinds of outside parametric, uh, outside a EQ, band EQs, parametric EQs, delay systems up there. I mean, this is a massive thing to fill a room like this with sound. And it's not like when something goes wrong, you can look back there and go, fix it. I mean, he, he's going to do that. He's going, oh, man, what's going on? You know, and, and, and in sound, you start a process of evaluation. It's like, okay, well, right, no, well, right, the channel's working. The mic's working. Why isn't this working? So then you start doing the pilot error stuff. And usually that's what it is. You forgot to turn something up, take a mute off or something. Yes. He asked if he's sitting back there and the bass isn't loud enough, does he have the liberty to move it? Absolutely, because that's what he is. He's a sound engineer and he mixes. So because it changes, like more bodies, the bass disappears. So he has to turn it up. Now we do have a, a dB level monitor and we try, believe it or not, some of the folks who sit in this area, you know what the funny thing is, Bill? Everybody who doesn't like it loud sits right where it is. This is a hot spot right here in our sound, right in this area. If you don't want loud, don't get here. It's going to be loud. And the reason it's going to be loud is because it's, there's a dead spot over there. There's a couple of dead spots that we're working toward trying to get them corrected. But people, is it true, days? The people who gripe the most will never sit where they should sit because you're always trying to play the volumes. And we have a DB monitor and days. What do you usually run the house at?
We run 97 to 100 dB of sound in here. And the reason we do that is because our crowds are really loud. Our crowds some nights are 102 to 104 dB shouting and worshiping. And trying to get anything up over that is hard. We lose singer, singers over here, I'll tell you. We lose our monitors most of the time, and we're just yelling into the air because on Friday night, yeah, they're, saying they're, they're filling this area up because on Friday nights, all this area, and Sunday mornings, all this area is full of chairs, and the people are right here. And when they start shouting, those monitors cannot, they can't overcompensate for 30, 40 people here and right in front of ah! So it's, you know, it's crazy. It's a good problem. It's really a good problem. But it gets really loud. How many watts of power are running? You know that offhand? 200,000. Are you hearing the same thing on stage that they're hearing out here? Or do you have a different... Have a separate... That guy over there is a monitor mix mix uh, guy. How many channels do you have over there? 40. So we have, uh, what, six... How many mixes? 12 mixes? We have 12 monitor mixes. And we have 48 channels there. So there's a complete different PA up on here than there is back there. No, he controls that. What is being heard? Yeah, well, actually, each individual station. Like, if Justin can't hear keys, then he tells him what he wants. Bass player can't hear something. At what point should you have... At what point... She's asking a question concerning the size of your church. At what point do you go to a monitor person? I think at which point that you have enough people to operate it. It's always good in any size of situation to have a monitor person because instead of having to go, you know, in the middle of, you're standing on front of the stage and, and something's not right and the guy at the back, you're going, hey, I can't hear. They never watch you. Well, I mean, yeah, it's tough. And if you got a guy right there on stage, you can just throw a book at him. That's the good part. No, I mean, it, it, he's, his focus is to make sure the people on stage are all right. His focus is to make sure what's happening in the house is all right and to make sure all the mics are on when someone picks it up to cue it. Yeah. What control would you like your guitars have um, as far as their volume? When they want to pull in and play, um, you know, like... Uh, how much control? Yeah, a volume. She wants to know how much volume headroom you're allowed back there on the guitar. He monitors through an amp. Oh, let me get up here where you are. We're going to wrap this up soon, but this is good. I'm using the, I've got a guitar amp, I'm using that to monitor myself, and then I've got a, a separate monitor here that I can hear my, my mix in. And then most of the time, I've got a volume pedal that I use um, in my whole preamp section here, and I'll maybe leave a little bit of space to, to pump it all the way if I want to if I want to send more volume during a certain part. But most of the time, I send them a max signal and a sound check so they know where my peak level is so I don't overblast anything. He's not going past max, the maxed out sound. Any more questions? I'm moving fast here. I'm taking questions from someone who hasn't had one yet. That would be great. Yes. Can you give me some idea of how to explain a kind of rhythm you want to your drummer? <laughs> Good question. You know what? Uh, I think sometimes examples if you can if you can find a musical example it's easy sometimes if you don't play drums you play what you play keyboard sometimes uh if you can get a musical example on a cd or something uh, a lot of times we'll do that right well when you're hearing something in your heart it's it's really a tough thing for you to, to learn if you're not a drummer, to understand how to create that rhythm. But like I said, like we'll come up with songs and we'll go, oh, there's, there's a song that has that rhythm, kind of. And uh, I'll tell you one that's funny. Y'all are gonna laugh. I, you know, I, I haven't always been on fire. Um, there are songs that have universal appeal, okay? This is terrible to say in church, but okay. Y'all know me by now. You remember that tune that we did on years ago? You may not know it. But it's called New Every Morning. It's kind of country, but it's not really country. 
You know what I mean? And I didn't like what Vineyard did with it. I wanted to do what we did with it. So I wanted it to have that, that, that kind of a train feel, like the train going under the track. And the only thing I could think of to tell the drummer was, have you ever heard of Eric Clapton saying, lay down Sally? <laughs> kind of that lay down Sally thing that. I'm an E, E. Matt has never played this song. Tricking with Matt. Oh, great is the thing for Okay. See, he, he's playing the lay down Sally bass line. That's exactly what he's doing. Isn't that terrible? Isn't that awful? But I mean, it's, I'm just telling you. It's, it's whatever you can remember that has that rhythm. Because well, all we are, musically, as human beings, we're a composite of everything we've heard. And if you're a new believer, then all the references you have are from wherever you were. So when you write stuff, it's probably going to sound like what, what's in there. Whereas I can play Sister Church Lady. Most guys who grew up playing in club bands, they have no idea what I just did. And they think it's amusing. And the closest thing they can come to is some kind of a ragtime thing. But for me, I grew up in church, and I've heard every church player you can imagine at every level you can imagine. But a club guy who comes in who's never played anything but club bands and rock bands and jazz bands and blues bands, his references are going to be totally different when he's writing music. Uh, let's do a couple more grooves and let you go. And then if there's any more questions, we'll entertain them. But I want you to get a good rest. And I want some lunch. Are y'all hungry? What's that? Use this one. Trash this. All right. Uh, what's another good one? Let's see. What's a song everybody's familiar with? Oh, hey, let's do a gospel feel. Let's do, uh, let's do, well, Enemy's Camp is like all over the place. So let's do that one. Enemy's Camp goes through three different groove changes. The whole trilogy, the, the medley, it goes through three different groove changes. It starts off, and I don't think you've ever played this one either. <laughs> this just remember, three different changes. And the last one is that kind of walking gospel thing. Not that. The last one is, hello, come to me. Come to me, you lost one. All right, here we go. All right, here we go. The last one is in, it's in B flat, and the last one is more of that, that look what the Lord has done. It's that two-beat gospel thing, okay? But it doesn't start there. And it starts more with a... Well, I went to the enemy's camp And I took back what he stole from me Took back what he stole from me Took back what he... Ah, uh, by the way, Y'all, all you religious folks here and get mad at me. That move is from Billy Preston. <laughs> off of that. That's off of. Will they go around in circle? Will they go around this? Just steal it out. Just sanctify it and use it. Okay. People all over the world just shouted and worshiped God, and they didn't know Billy Preston came up with that move. What they don't know won't hurt them. When I get to heaven, I'm going to really know how to play that. But that's the first groove, and then we go, but listen, I'm playing, uh, I'm playing, well, I went to the enemy's camp, and 
That's all I'm doing. Took back what he stole from me. I'm just hitting the chord. Took back what he stole from me. I went. That's all I'm doing. Now, if I didn't have the rhythm section, I would play it like, Well, I went to the enemy's camp And I took back what he stole from me I'd have to play everything. I'd have to do it all. But see, if I do all that now, it's just going to be a mess. Second groove we go into is, Can You Believe What The Lord Has Done For Me? And yeah, I just thought of what that groove is. Lord, forgive us. Can you believe a Lord has done me? Fine. Don't you know he can save and cleanse me? Turn my life around. Set my feet up on a solid ground. Right, you hear the difference in the groove? Because it started off with... Look what the Lord... All right, here we go to the next groove. Can you believe what the Lord... See, it lays back a little bit, and I start playing just solid chords. Because i got to hold these down. basically all there is to it, okay? And let's go to the final groove. Can you believe what the Lord has done in me? Here we go, to be gospel time. Here we go. All right. Everybody's playing everything they know at that point. <laughs> everything. And there are several ways if you're not uh, on a certain level to play gospel. It's not your forte. You can just you can make it a lot simpler. You can just play like off of a seventh chord. Look what the Lord has done. I mean, you can play it more that way, and all that is is a B flat seven on the right hand. And and a, a lot of gospel music. I'm not an accomplished gospel player. I'm kind of a honky gospel player, but but a lot of it is more what's in, insinuated than what gets played. In other words, what makes that sound like a gospel chord is because I am sliding my, th my index finger off of the minor. In other words, if I play a straight B minor 7, B flat minor 7, it don't have it. But if I play a straight B flat, it sounds dead. But if I, it has a little thing to it, okay? And another thing with the gospel thing is, is getting the rhythm. It's all rhythm. And like, like this feel. It's, it sounds hard, but it's all placement of rhythm. It's just, it's boogie woogie. I mean, it's really, it comes from that, you know. And, and then this hand is just doing. But you put the two hands together, you get. And see, I'm leaving space for this hand to do this little thing and then just kind of accenting. And it's all this is. It's, I mean, you can't get easier than that. And then you can get this thing going. It's all insinuation. Do you understand? It's not the notes you're playing. It's the insinuation you're doing. All rhythm, all dynamic. Any questions? All you piano players, come out and play that feel right now. In the name of Jesus. You have a question. Yes, you. Oh, we want different questions. That thing. Uh-huh. 
musical are you? I mean, do you know chords and things? the pastor doing it, I don't know. I mean, it just depends on how. Well, let me tell you something that happened to me when I came to Brownsville. We're close with this. When I came to Brownsville, I was doing a lot of gospel stuff, you know, and, and everything was flat nights and all that kind of business. And I love that stuff. That's my heart. That's where I grew up. But when God sent me to Brownsville, he sent me into something that he was doing fresh and new, and he was asking me to adapt to a new music. And it was a hard adaptation for me because I wanted to play all my cool chords, all of my, you know. I mean, all that stuff, and it, it's really great, but, but that just, I mean, think about it. He has fire in his eye, so on his hand. He's laying right all, all, all across his land. I mean, it's, it just goes a whole different place that the song, you know, it just isn't there. So I was forced to learn to play without a third tone in the chord, like a guitar player. He has fire in his eyes. I mean, I'm playing on my right hand, a C, a G, and a C. That's it. And guess what? I'm going to move one finger. F. I just moved one finger. I'm playing a C, F, C. Now I'm playing a C, G, C. Oh, I just moved two fingers. Y'all wake me up when it's over. But see, it's it's a lot of what's going on now. And, and then I went out and I thought, well, if I gotta be a guitar player, let me try to sound like one. Because guitar players, when they're playing a rhythm like that, usually don't play a third. Because it would sound like I mean, it just loses something in that translation. And that was what God was using. God was using songs like, um, Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. Is that simple? I mean, I'm, I'm not even playing a full chord with any of this. Again, I'm, I'm play, it's in D. And this hand has got an A, a D, and an A. And a bass, bass D's. And I'm just doing this little melody. That's all it is. But you hear, do you hear the atmosphere that gets created with that? It just creates kind of a, I'd say something else I do sometimes. I got a couple of bags of tricks up here. This is primarily, we'll cover this and we'll be done. This is primarily my piano. The bottom one here is just pretty much, I use it for piano only. Uh, that's pretty much all it does. Occasionally, if I'm in a particularly funky mood, like on, that's my Lord. But that's about all I ever use. But what I've got over here is a, is a Roland JV-1080, and it's a pretty inexpensive piece of gear. And I, I've got a, a Korg Trinity, and I use every th different things for different reasons. Like take the piano out. This is just the Korg Trinity playing a guitar sound. Now, what, what, and this is just the Roland sound. By itself, it's kind of weenie sounding, but it's wonderful to layer with stuff, and it's got, 
it's got like this thing on the modulation wheel of the keyboard. If I turn it up instead of making it go eh, like it usually does on most sounds, it brings a string sound in. Without affecting everything else. So if I start off with a song like Come Holy Spirit, I'll just start straight with the guitar. Now if I want to fat it up a little bit, I just add a little of that keyboard sound. Listen, listen to the difference. See, just change it slightly, and then we get to the big part of the strings. Come Holy Spirit. And it just creates atmosphere, is all it does. Music is just to create atmosphere. And you can use sounds in your keyboards to do that. And everybody's doing keyboards now, so. Are there any more questions? I need to let you all go. You're so sweet. Yes. Rehearse, doing, playing prophetically and, and that kind of thing in your rehearsal? We don't rehearse the prophetic thing, do we? It just happens spontaneously in the service usually. We usually have very little time for rehearsal, so we get in here and do what we got to do and move on really fast. Somebody had a question right here. Yes, sir. How often do we rehearse? <laughs> <laughs> That's not a good question. Uh, our choir rehearses every other week. Uh, in the fall, we'll go to a full every week rehearsal for an hour and a half to two hours. Uh, our band, we singers don't even go there. I mean, if I were in a normal church, I would rehearse once a week with my praise team and band. And we should, this fall, Brownsville will go to more rehearsals because now I've got lots of help. But when I was doing all the services alone, and I mean, the last thing I want to do is come to a rehearsal and just have time. Uh, but now Judy rehearses choir, Mike rehearses band, and in the fall they'll go to probably a weekly or bi-weekly. But another thing, we are so blessed with our players, they're really fast. And usually if I give them a tape, Brenda, my secretary, will make a cassette of what we're going to rehearse. They'll have it when they walk in. And it usually doesn't take us long to have it. Uh, we need some rehearsal right now to tighten up. We're pretty loose. But, but usually I would recommend a, you know, a couple hours a week if, you ha if that's, that's the best and most perfect. You had a question there? For the service. Good question. Uh, I have, for five years of revival, I never had a song list. Uh, and I never did anything in the same key. Uh, that's why it was always hard to play with me. And I'm murder on drummers because it's, the groove is very important to me. But that's how I work. But see, I spent years doing song lists. I did them all my life. But now I don't do one unless I'm recording. And if I'm recording, I know there's a certain amount of songs I've got to get in. And I will make sure the list is happening. But if you're a beginner worship leader or intermediate, you should have a song list. And you know it helps plus we've started just doing these screen I mean we're new if y'all seen this screen thing kind of flopping around we apologize for that it's it's brand new to us we haven't been doing it long because Browns will never put the words up and and we didn't because it just first of all it was very expensive to do it second of all it just wasn't feasible because we were going all over the place but now I'm learning I'm having to put some words I'm having to give it a list back there because they don't know the they don't know where we're going if I don't and, and, you know, you get the wrong song. And there's so many songs, they can't latch on to the, the thing quick enough to get it up there. I think the intercessors are finished. So I want to release you. I want to say thank you so much. Tonight, 7 o'clock, get ready to pray now. Get some food, all right?